Hi, I'm Jonathan Goal. This show is about picture-taking problems and how to solve them. One of the great satisfactions in photography comes when you first reach beyond your basic skills to solve some very difficult, unique photographic problem. Problem solving, in fact, is a major part of photography for me, and it also happens to be the fun part, the part I enjoy. Look. Here's a photograph by Frank Seitman, made in the rain. And here's another photograph, also by Frank, made during a snowstorm. The problem here is to take pictures like this, if you want to, and to still keep your camera dry. Capturing a scene like this, of course, can be tremendously exciting, but there is a problem because the camera happens to be a very delicate instrument. It's not waterproof, and if you get any rain or snow in it, or salt spray, which is the worst thing of all, why, you can corrode or rust the interior parts. They're very, very delicate. So the problem is, how can you protect your camera and still get pictures like those? The problem, the solution, can be found in the use of a common plastic bag, like this. Now, in a real pinch, of course, you could simply take your camera, put it in the plastic bag, and take the picture in the rain that way, but because the plastic some bags are not all that transparent, uh, I'll show you how to make a camera protector which takes very sharp pictures. Here's the first thing you do. Lay the camera down, and then somewhere in the top third of the bag, take a magic marker and trace a circle which is just a little bit smaller than the lens thread, the front size of the lens. Take the camera out of the bag, then take a scissors and cut out this circle. And this will be the hole that you shoot through. But by the time I'm finished with this, it will be a hole that admits no rain or snow. Then you put the camera back in, like that, and then you take a common skylight filter or ultraviolet filter and you use this if you want to secure the plastic. That's it. That's all there is. Then if you want for extra protection you can take a sunshade like this, screw that into the front which helps keep the filter dry, and then put your hand or at least one of the hands inside the bag and then sliding through the back you can take pictures in the rain protecting the camera. Now choose a plastic bag that happens to be transparent enough to allow you to sight through the rear so that you can see a relatively clear image at least. As far as taking exposures in the rain, of course, you must think that it's easier if you have a built-in meter in the camera. That's true. You just sight through it and get the exposure. But if you happen to use a handheld meter, well, don't feel that you're left out of the rain. You can just wrap a handheld meter also in a plastic bag and simply aim it make the adjustments accordingly and set it on the camera. This keeps the meter dry. By the way, I often wrap cameras and meters in plastic bags just for general storage. The reason is that even if they're not being used and they're just sort of lying around, well, cameras and meters and other photographic gear can pick up enough dust and atmospheric grime to cause annoying and sometimes difficult to repair electrical, optical, and mechanical problems. So take care of your equipment and it will take care of you. If you take care of your gear, the payoff, of course, is long service in the long run. Now, as I just said, using a plastic bag over the lens without the hole in it can sometimes give you a diffused picture. Well, what if you would really like to have a diffused picture? After all, it sometimes can be a nice result. Take a look at this photograph made by Marsha Keegan at a circus in 1967. It has a very soft, nice effect. You can see these spotlights here, which are all being blurred out by diffusion. Here's a little circus rider in the middle. The center of the picture is relatively sharp. You should just use the simple technique of diffusion, something over the lens like plastic, to get this particular result. Now I'll show you how you can do that with the regular camera. You can take a, some plastic bag, get yourself a rubber band. <laughs> Here's the camera. And if you want, you can simply hold the plastic over the lens to take a picture. But if you want that center section to have some sharpness, then it's a good idea to cut a teeny little hole in the center to allow some undiffused light rays to come through. Then put this over the lens with the hole in the center. Take a rubber band. 
or you could also use the 1A filter again, and hold it on in that fashion. I do recommend, by the way, when you're photographing with diffusers, that you use wide apertures. I think it enhances the effect. It helps throw the background out of focus, generally. Be careful, however, when you're using diffusion, because not all subjects work equally well with it. It's a very romantic and soft effect. Some subjects just simply don't look right. So take your picture twice, both with a diffuser and without a diffuser, and then the results themselves should tell you, of course, whether the technique was right or not. Now, how many times have you wanted to capture, say, uh, a kind of scene where the clouds were very, very strong. You saw this beautiful effect of clouds. You went and you took your picture with black and white film, and instead of getting the rich result that you wanted, you got instead a result that looked more like this. Well, this is disappointing. The clouds are all bleached out. You cannot tell the difference between the sky and the clouds. It's not that interesting a photograph. What's the problem? Well, Don Dietz, who made this picture, um, understood that when you use black and white film, the distinction between a white cloud and a blue sky is often lost, as it is here. How much more dramatic it would be if we could, in fact, in this print, see the strong effect of the clouds in the sky. After all, they were in the original scene, and it's the reason, one of the reasons, why Donald Dietz decided to take this picture. Smart photographer, he used a contrast filter such as this. You can use a contrast filter to increase the appearance of the clouds. This is a number eight yellow contrast filter, and it simply screws onto the front of the camera lens like this. There you go. Well, when Donald Eats then took the picture again using the number eight yellow contrast filter, he got a result that looked like this. Now look at the comparison. Now the sky is darker, the clouds stand out more crisply. In fact, many of the tonalities throughout the entire photograph are a little bit more crisp. Yellow filters have the ability to darken a blue sky. That is how it will look in the final print, which is why they're often called cloud filters. They help produce in black and white a result that tends to resemble what your actual eye saw at the scene, particularly with clouds. Now, here is another filter, a much stronger color filter. It's red, and it's called the number 25 red filter. It produces a much stronger result, and when Donald Eats used this for the next photograph, well, he got, as you can see, an even stronger cloud effect. Now the blue sky is much darker still, forcing the clouds to stand out in clear relief, and all of the other tones in the print as well have picked up snap. They've picked up life and vibrancy. In fact, a scene like this taken with a red filter often tends to be more dramatic and striking than it is in real life. Now, yellow and red contrast filters have the ability to partially block blue light from exposing the film. And anything that happens to be blue, such as a sky or a blue shirt, will print out darker in the final result if a black and, in black and white if such a filter is used, particularly if you happen to be using the red filter. Now, perhaps I can explain how filters work a little better by showing you something called a color chart. Here is one. It has the primary colors of red, blue, and yellow, and the complementaries of green, violet, and orange. Now, a fi filter of a particular color, say yellow, will darken any color that happens not to be similar to it. And if you look on the other side of the color chart, you'll see blue, violet, uh, red, uh, the yellow filter will have to, will to some degree darken these other colors. They're on the opposite side. Now at the same time, a contrast filter will tend to lighten any color which is similar to it. In this case, using this pic filter would lighten the black and white tone of a yellow or an orange as, it, as you saw it in the original scene. In fact, by looking through a filter like this, you can often gauge the final result like this. You can see the sky get a little bit darker. Just remember, though, when you're trying to gauge the result this way, that these filters will lighten any color that is similar to it and will darken any color that is not similar to it. That's the principle of their operation. Many photographers like to use the number eight yellow filter for nearly all of their general outdoor black and white photography, and they usually reserve the red filter just for 
special effects. Now keep in mind that filters absorb light when you put them over the lens, and you therefore have to increase the camera exposure to make up for the difference, otherwise you'll get underexposed negatives. Now the instruction sheets that come both with the filters and usually with your black and white film will give you pretty detailed exposure compensating information, and you should follow it carefully to avoid underexposure. But I should tell you that the exposure information they give is based on the use, I always have trouble finding my gear, is based on the use of a handheld light meter such as this. You take the exposure and then reset according to the directions. Just follow those directions and they'll tell you how many stops to open up. It's important for you to realize that the instructions are for these and not for cameras that have built-in meters. Now, if you happen to have a built-in meter on your camera, then it's very important for you to understand, when you're using filters, where the meter cell happens to be. For example, here is a camera where the meter cell happens to be on the body of the camera, right on top. And if it does, if the meter cell happens to be there, then you can just use this as a light meter and then reset the exposure accordingly. However, most cameras today have a meter which is built into the camera and is usually located behind the taking lens. Or it might be in a position on the lens in such a way that if you were to put a filter on it, it would cover the meter cell. This is very important. If you have a behind the lens meter, you can more or less hope that the meter will give you correct compensation reading through it. But not all built-in meters are equally accurate. And they all respond differently sometimes with different colored filters. So I recommend that to get the best exposures, you take a few pictures in advance of any real important photograph and check out the results and see, see how it is. Now if, for example, you were using the red filter and your black and white negatives turned out a little bit underexposed from what you thought they should be, you can compensate a little the next time you use the red filter by opening up a half a stop or so on the aperture, uh, the aperture control, the f-stop ring. By the way, when you use color filters like this on a camera loaded with color film, it has the effect of changing the entire scene into the color of that particular filter. Well, that was exactly the effect that Pete Turner hoped to get in this picture that he made of a cannonball. Now, this was originally made with Kodachrome film with a blue filter over the lens, and he picked up this beautiful, surreal quality to this scene. Very, very deliberate. Remember, when you're purchasing your filters, to take your camera with you to the store so that you can be sure of getting an exact fit filter for your particular lens. All the different lenses are different sizes and the filters that come with them are too, the filters that fit them. Well now, in this particular series, I've dealt mostly with manual cameras. That is, the kind that you adjust yourself, the kind that have an adjustable aperture and a shutter control. I like those kind of cameras because they allow me to have total control over the final result of the picture. But many people today, as you probably know, are using automatic cameras. Well, more like this. This is an automatic rangefinder camera. And they come in many different models from the very simple to the very sophisticated and complex. Well, they happen to be an awful lot of fun, as I guess most of you know. And in fact, believe it or not, I use an automatic camera sometimes myself. I have a little pocket model here the pop-out lens, and I like them, they're fun, and I find that they work very well under most conditions of light. They're generally reliable. However, however, they are easily fooled, these automatic cameras, uh, when you use them under tricky conditions of light. Well, the problem is, is that their electronics cannot compensate for light that's coming from a strange direction so it might not give you a correct aperture setting or a shutter speed setting. They cannot think for themselves. I'll show you what I mean by showing you a couple of comparison prints made with an automatic camera. Here's the first one. Well, the subject is supposed to be a couple of tap dancers, but you can hardly, three tap dancers, you can hardly see that because they are underexposed, they're too dark. Why is that? Well, the automatic exposure system in the camera remember these cameras set themselves, was overly influenced by the strong brightness from the window and was not influenced enough by the rather weak brightness 
of light reflecting from the subjects themselves. The camera could not compensate for this excessively backlit situation. This is the problem. How can you get correct exposures of a situation like this using automatic cameras? Well, luckily, many of the automatic cameras made today have what is called a manual override. That is, they have a manual position for the controls so that you can use it automatically or manually if you like. With this camera, you can switch it off automatic, and then what you would do to get a correct exposure here, for example, is you would, with the camera on manual use, go up to the subjects and measure the light coming, say, just from the central dancer's shirt. Exclude entirely any light coming from the window. Then set the controls there that the meter indicates you should have. Then move back to your shooting position, raise the camera to your eye, and take the picture. If you did that with the automatic camera set on manual, you then have a chance of getting a result more like this from the same scene taken minutes later. Now look what's happening. The three dancers are correctly exposed. They're as light as they should be. The background window is too bright, but who cares? That's not the subject the dancers are. If you have an automatic camera that does not have manual operation, and most of the simpler cameras work that way, there still is a nifty way that you can alter the exposure those cameras give you. And the key is to use what's called the ASA adjustment dial, which in this case is on the bottom. You set it for the particular film speed you happen to be using. If you reset it, you will change the exposure of light that hits the film. Many automatic cameras, this one included, have several numbers in the viewfinder which tell you what particular exposure the automatic meter happens to be choosing for you. Well, in the case of the backlit subjects, I would again take this camera and move up, and I would measure, say, the shirt of this particular dancer real close, and I would take mental note of what the exposure happened to say. Now, if, let's just say, for example, it, it happened to say 1 60th of a second at an aperture of f4. Remember that. Well, then you step back to the shooting position and you raise the camera to your eye again, and when you look, you'll notice that suddenly the exposure indicator has jumped up to a much higher number. Well, that's because it's suddenly responding to the light blasting through those windows. You'll find that if you take that ASA control dial and shift it down to lower ASA numbers, say from 400 to 200, 100, whatever your film originally happens to be, and look through the finder at the same time, you will eventually be able to get the camera to again have an exposure of 1 60th of a second at f4. You'll have fooled the camera into thinking it's operating with a slower ASA film, and it works. You would then get a good result. If you happen to have one of the super simple, uh, very easy to use automatic cameras that does not have exposure indicator settings in the window, you can still, with a subject like this, take a chance on getting a good exposure of it by just yourself, on your own, resetting that ASA control from whatever your film speed is down, say, to a number that's two stops slower. Uh, if you went from 400 to 200 ASA, that would give you twice as much exposure, and you could open it up another stop to 100 ASA, giving you four times as much. But don't forget to reset the ASA on the camera back to the original film speed setting when you go back into a normal lit situation. Well, regardless of the type of camera you were using, did you ever find yourself in a situation where you wanted to take pictures of people um, in such a candid way that you simply caught them in the act of being themselves, as if you weren't there? Did you ever want to take pictures like, for example, this one? Well, this picture was made at a Tanglewood concert. These young people were listening to the music, and I was intrigued by their expression, and to take a picture of them without making them self-conscious, I simply took my camera, already cocked and ready to go, put it on the ground in front of me while I dutifully listened to them, aimed it in their general direction, and took the picture like that. I didn't even sight through the finder. Well, this low angle, of course, gave me this unusual view of the feet and a lot of the sky, but it's a nice picture. I like the way it turned out. Here's another one. This one was made at the Faneuil Hall Marketplace in Boston of a man selling silvered balloons, and I wanted to get his picture in a candid fashion. Well, he saw me, but he didn't have time to react to my taking a picture of him because I'll show you what I did. I took the camera and instead of photographing him this way, I suddenly went like that. Raised the camera over my head, took a variety of shots, 
just aiming it into the general direction of the picture. In fact, if you look closely at the picture, you can see an image of me standing there with the camera over my head. This is also a great way to take a picture of a parade if you're standing behind a lot of people. <laughs> just raise the camera over your head. The last picture is a good example of what's called over-the-shoulder photography, namely over your own. That's me in a stunt plane pilot. And to get this picture, I just, because uh, I couldn't see him, I just held the camera like this and took a picture over my shoulder. I didn't know that I would get myself in the picture as well. Well, you might think that it happens to be very difficult to get pictures along this line, but if you do it a lot, I think you'll be surprised at how many pictures actually come out, and come out rather interestingly too. In fact, you might be rather amused by the offbeat compositions that you tend to get. Heads over here, feet over there. It's a new kind of photography. Well, let me give you some tips on helping you to ensure that you get the best possible results from this kind of picture taking. One is load your camera with fast film, 200 to 400 ASA. That allows you to use high shutter speeds of 125th or faster to stop action. Then you would use, of course, relatively small apertures of f8, 11, or 16. This gives you a lot of depth of field, so you don't have to focus every single second. And then you might also choose to preset the focus for the general range of most of your subjects. With the young people at the concert, the camera was preset for four feet, and I knew that the depth of field would take care of the extra distances. I find that this kind of rapid photography is a little bit easier if you're using a wide-angle lens. Well, that's not essential that you do, but it helps a little bit, because it gives you a greater margin for error in the framing of the pictures. Now, think about why I'm telling you this for a second. You know that if you happen to be seen taking a picture, struggling with the controls and the focus, and can't quite get it, that you're going to make the subject nervous and self-conscious. The whole idea in candid photography is for you to remain as unobtrusive as possible in your photography. That way you'll have fun, you'll get the pictures you want, you won't intimidate other people. So practice taking your camera and operating it on the sly, like that, and even over your shoulder. Um, you do it enough, you check your results out enough, you'll find that your timing and your accuracy of the frame will improve each time you try to do it. I love taking pictures this way. Have you ever wanted to take instead a picture of yourself? Well, if your camera focuses closely enough, you can do it that way. But I guess most people take pictures of themselves by using a mirror. Here's such a picture. And it's OK. I like the picture. But the camera itself is also a major part of the picture. It, in fact, itself is a subject. Well, there is a way that you can take a picture without a mirror, and it's by using the self-timer lever that comes with most cameras today. On this particular camera, it's a lever on the side, which once you say put the camera on a tripod and jump into position, you would <laughs> press that first, then it would jump into position, and after several seconds delay, the camera would take the picture of you. Well, if your camera does not happen to have the self-timing lever, you can still take a picture of yourself, and I'll show you how. This particular camera does not have the self-timing lever, but I use it for self-timed pictures. I added to it a little clockwork device which trips the shutter. It has a spring mechanism, and a, it is a timer, in fact, an auxiliary device which screws into the same socket that you would put a cable release into. Now, let's take a picture. Let's see. I've got this thing preset for a quarter of a second at f16 with 400 ASA film. Film is pulled out. It's all set to go. I'm going to take a picture of myself. Okay, here we go. Process the film, like that, and uh, I'll just reload here. Now, if you can use instant film, of course, to do this, and you'll get instant results, but, of course, you can do this with regular film as well. Let's see what the result looks like. <laughs> Not bad. There's another way that you can get yourself into your own pictures, and it can really be an awful lot of fun. This is sort of an offbeat way to do it, and you don't even need a self-timer on your camera. All you need is a camera which, which you can set for time exposures, 
and a common household flashlight. I'll show you what to do. Let's see, I've got to reset this now. For time exposure, so put it on T. You can also use a locking shutter release cable if you want. And I'll turn it over here because I want a dark background. This technique really works best when you use a darkened room, very dark room. So turn out the lights to your room, get the flashlight ready, and then with the camera on T, set it off, open the shutter like this. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Well, let's see if I have a picture. As you can see, I just shine the light on myself and move myself around. With any kind of luck at all, I'll have a picture of myself. <laughs> Absolutely insane. In the last few minutes, I'd like to go to the gallery and um, show you a picture or two which have, in which the photographers have used, used some of these techniques. Here's a print photograph by Ansel Adams, and I think the dark sky was made by using a dark filter, a uh, dark red filter probably, or perhaps an orange filter. You can see how strong the dark sky is against the light clouds. Well, the filter also had the effect of darkening the water because that was reflecting the blue sky. Okay. Go out, take a camera everywhere that's where the pictures are, try a filter once in a while, and keep shooting.